Good morning and welcome back to my home. I promised I would be in the studio last week, but this week we're having a big program that's happening inside the uh, studio. So I'm going to be here one last time, probably going to be back here again next week, who knows. But let's, uh, let's pretend like I didn't say anything last week and let's move on to the next thing. It is May 7th. Friday. Um, I'm taping this the day before, so a lot of the news items is kind of ongoing, but you can look up more information like on many different various news sources, NPR, um, anything you basically can uh, throw a, a subscription to. Um, but yeah, do your footwork, and if you read a, a headline, uh, also read the article. Moving on, and speaking of which, uh, one of the things that really just kind of struck me is that uh, uh, Facebook is withholding uh, is, is holding their stand on the ban on uh, Donald Trump, former president, um, after the uh, January 6th riots. They decided to uh, ban him outright. A couple other uh, streaming platforms like Twitch uh, banned him outright a, a while before, um, and uh, soon after the uh, January 6th, Facebook and uh, Twitter uh, effectively banned Trump from um, tweeting and posting any uh, media and whatnot. And uh, the Facebook did meet with the panel to decide whether or not they wanted to uh, let him back with the suspension. Um, usually they look at the panel, they look at uh, their options, and they usually have to have about six months to figure out uh, whether they're going to let him back in or outright ban him from the platform that has garnered $35 million on Facebook alone for just Trump. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Facebook CEO, has long said that the company should not be the arbiter, arbiter of truth and has argued for a hands-off approach to political speech, in particular saying it's highly, already highly scrutinized. But of course, if you are on Facebook, it is mostly politicized and everyone's saying this and they're getting uh, really bad information spread through that system as well. But I think it's uh, very important that we all take personal responsibility for what we're posting online as well. Um, yeah. As we get deeper into the pandemic, one country seemed uh, to have caught my eye, uh, Haiti. Uh, Haiti covered uh, the news for, for their massive earthquake back in 2010. Can you believe it? It's been over 10 years since the Haitian earthquake that nearly devastated that country, causing so many cholera outbre uh, outbreaks and whatnot. But this year, uh, COVID seems to be uh, much luckier for them than it is, has been for other countries. Uh, their death toll... Uh, has reached uh, 258, 254 deaths the entire time the pandemic has happened and hit the country. Many professionals were perplexed by the poor nations of folks only making the equivalent of $2,000 $2, a year uh, were able to avoid major effects like even a second wave, which never happened. Shelter in place couldn't apply to a lot of those poor countries because many of them had to go and do that. The World Health Organization offered AstraZeneca uh, vaccine to the population, but the Haitian government refused. I think it was more of a, nah, we're good kind of situation. This doesn't excuse the fact that countries like the U.S. are seeing 1,800 uh, people per million um, in terms of death rates and places like Europe is seen as high as 3,000 per million people. Um, you've probably heard or seen the news about people in England going maskless and doing a lot of those maskless protests. Even Madrid, Spain had maskless protests just last Sunday. So far, the world is going back and forth with their mask mandates or even more. So the folks doing everything right to follow their CDC guidelines are waiting to get back to some form of normal. That's um, kind of where we're at here in Missoula as we are transitioning in Missoula. Um, Missoula's news, uh, May, May 11th, which is happening next Tuesday, is the health board basic uh, final decision on whether or not they're going to uh, switch from a mandate mask order to a recommendation, which means a business within their purview can more than uh, likely uh, keep on their mask uh, wear, be, making sure that people wear masks when entering their store. It is a private uh, business and if they have certain standards and some corporate uh, businesses will continue doing the mask thing and some places will not have um uh, open entries to some food industries, places, and whatnot, because I've seen a lot of places that are utilizing the drive through but are not utilizing their seating inside their facility. Uh, but of course, what's also happening this week is that Missoula Gives, 
uh, part of their annual giving uh, campaign. Uh, it is a nonprofit through the Missoula Community Foundation. They are doing a live stream starting uh, that started on Thursday and will begin again this morning. And they're going to start it from 8 a.m. So it's going to be on their YouTube, Twitch, and I believe Facebook pages, the Missoula Community Foundation. And you can look up hashtag Missoula Gives. And this is important because they're looking to raise a million dollars for local area nonprofits in Missoula. Missoula is known for a lot of nonprofits. If you've been around Missoula, you know that there are well over 200 nonprofits in the city of Missoula alone. And this is a, one of those many benefits that uh, Goodwill that is going towards uh, raising money for local area nonprofits. Moving on, um, one thing uh, uh, that happened on Thursday as well is that Missoula's own YWCA, YWCA spoke on uh, about the new Metal Arc building that just opened up on 3rd Street. Uh, with this new facility, they're going to hopefully be able to uh, navigate women and their children who struggle with housing and domestic violence. And it is going to be a, a nice shelter for a lot of folks. To, uh, and, and basically, one of the biggest things is they want to retain their dignity. And here is a, a clip from the Ribbon Coven ceremony, uh, videoed by our very own Ron Schull of MCAT. Accomplishment. We are preparing to welcome the first families to the Family Housing Center this Sunday. That's when our work will really begin. Uh, you know, we will be all hands on deck helping these families find housing in one of the most challenging housing markets we've ever seen. But we have the depth of experience and the breadth of volunteer support to move forward and provide them the deepest sympathy the most sensitive outreach, the longest uh, look ahead, and the most limitless courage. Because that's what we do, that's what we've always done, and with your support, we will continue to do it for generations in this building. And if you guys get a chance to see it, you can't miss it. It is off of 3rd Avenue uh, between uh, Ro uh, Reserve Street and uh, Russell. Um, it's a beautiful building, uh, and I'm assuming we're going to get plenty of chances to see some interior shots later on down the line. Uh, of course, as we end... Uh, as we begin May, it also marks the end of our biannual uh, uh, legislation session. Uh, this year's was Montana's 67th legislature. Um, we ever we do a lot of these se uh, uh, sessions uh, two years here in the state of Montana, and this was a big deal because for the last 16 years we've had a Democratic governor basically kind of uh, vetoing a lot of bills that the uh, GOP, uh, the Republican-controlled uh, state, um, House and Senate were trying to push a lot of bills. So a lot of those bills kind of went went past unrestricted. And so uh, we have a lot of abortion uh, restrictions in the state of Montana, which don't supersede the uh, Roe versus Wade. Um, but with the abortions, they're uh, banning abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy. Um, and then, uh, and also, uh, uh, you have to have an in-person mandatory visit for women getting medication for abortions, for medically induced abortions. But of course, so far, the Republican majority has had to contend with the people's will to legalize marijuana for recreational use. Uh, many of the GOPs, especially one uh, GOP uh, representative from Great Falls, uh, paid money to do a campaign to... Uh, uh, um, get people to not to vote against I-190 that was passed by the voter people of that. Uh, one the thing that they were doing is they were kind of figuring out exactly what they're going to do with something that they had no idea what they're going to do with. Um, so what they ended up doing is that 20% uh, of the revenue garnished from marijuana recreational weed sales will be going towards, um, the 20% will be going, will be taxed. 32% of that tax money will go to conservation efforts. Um, state parks, trails, and non-game wildlife account. The majority of the remaining revenue will go into a state's general fund, the, quote, checking account. Counties also have the ability to opt out. It is all a registration. Counties within the purview will be able to register people and permits for anybody who wants to sell medical uh, to uh, sell marijuana and other medical marijuanas who are going to be transitioning into selling recreational pot will be grandfathered in into this new program. But don't expect any of these stores to be popping up, but expect the earliest weed stores to be open by earliest January 2022. 
But one of the other big things to happen is that Montana also passed a gun concealed carry uh, allowance, which would allow for people to have a concealed carry arm on their person at any time. Um, but of course, there are some restrictions to uh, some of these uh, um, concealed carry arms, which include schools, college campuses, banks, and unless otherwise posted bars. As private citizens, uh, what people do in their private property is up to them and not those visiting. Always remember in Montana, always remember the Montana way, uh, leave your campsites better than you found it. Uh, up next, we have a taste of KBGA's Pay It For You, Play, Pay it, Play it Forward, Volume 3, The Pedophoggers. So swift, rain falling in. Gonna see a movie called Gunga Dick. Pack up your money, plug your tent, McQuinn. You ain't going nowhere. Ooh, we ride me high. Tomorrow's the day my brides are gonna come. Ooh, we are, we gonna fly down to the easy chair. John could not keep on keeping on. Climb that bridge after it's gone. When we're way past it, Ooh, we ride behind. Tomorrow's the day my bride's gonna come. Ooh, we now we gonna fly down into the easy chair. Eventually. <laughs> hey guys, welcome back. It's time for Pre Critic, where I prejudge a movie based on absolutely nothing but maybe their poster, and I read a little bit of the synopsis. But I'm a little more uh, exposed to this next one. It's called Spiral. Chris Rock is in this movie as a serious detective guy looking for a serial killer who tortures their victims in a very Saw like circumstance. Yes, this is a spin off of the Saw franchise. Uh, we have another Saw movie, but it's replaced with a title, thinking that they can fool people into a reboot. Chris Rock joins Samuel L. Jackson playing his dad, who may or may not be the one killing and torturing um, other cops. So the whole idea is that this serial killer is targeting cops, and they're really just uh, going through this. It's very much like, um, it's going to be trying to be like a weird, cool mystery, um, only to lose to its David Fincher, Seven Edge. Uh, what's in this movie? A cop, a fractured father-son relation, and plenty of police corruption that only one man knows how to stop. But let's face it, he's going to get captured only, and you saw in the trailer, he gets captured, but he's only get, uh, um, but he, he has, he gets away, but at a great personal sacrifices, but he has a better relationship with his dad, or maybe his, and then maybe they go to a baseball game or whatever, or something that they reference in the show, and it's a cathartic circle and everything, or maybe his dad's the killer, I don't know, they kind of really imply it, he is, he is the bad guy, but I'm pretty sure he's not, if they imply it in the trailer, it's definitely not going to happen. Uh, this next one is called Those Who Wish Me Dead, is, uh, yeah, tells the tale about someone getting their comeuppance in a movie that looks into, let's check my notes. Oh, a teenage murder witness finds herself pursued by twin assassins in a Montana wilderness. Okay, so it's a Montana film and whatnot. So the whole idea is that you have Angelina Jolie in this movie. 
Um, and uh, when she's not giving faux hawk, hair, faux hawk haircuts to her kids, um, she gets shoehorned into a movie where she plays a hot shot, and hot shot it, it refers to those fire crews that uh, fight forest fires, and she, that's her job, and now she's trying to help this teenager get away from these assassins, but she also has picked up a bunch of skills. Hey, if you uh, swing one of those uh, pickaxes all the time for most of the day, you'll probably get pretty strong too. But yeah, that's kind of what happens. I'm pretty sure that the um, they fight the assassins and the while there's a fire in the backdrop happening, a forest fire, and she uses what her knowledge of a forest fire to uh, uh, turn the tables on these twin assassins. I don't know why they mention twin assassins. I'm assuming they're going to be like really quiet. They look at each other and there's some kind of psychic bond that they know about. Moving on, this next game, yes, it is time for some video games. It's called Resident Evil Village. Resident Evil Village, hey, people really liked um, the uh, demo for this game for obvious reasons. Uh, but let's uh, jump in, and this basically uh, starts you in in a European-esque Transylvanian town where you fight a bunch of werewolf, zombie, monsters, stuff. It's a video game, and Resident Evil has kind of gone into the um, myth mythos of a lot of uh, horror films in which... Originally, it was just a zombie franchise with like uh, mutants and stuff that they threw that they shoehorned in there. But then they decided to be like, "Hey, why don't we just make this into more of a mythical kind of thing?" Hence, Resident Evil Four, leading into all these other games, and then they just kind of went back into the whole like first person perspective and kind of like survival horror game. And then I guess as you get better, you uh, you uh, fight larger hordes of monsters and beasties. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming there's colorful characters in this game, and it's a survival horror, so chances are you'll keep playing until you win the game, and they'll be like, cool, I'm out of here. Next game. All right, so that concludes your pre-critic. If you want to learn more about this, uh, good luck, because I don't, I don't really learn more about it, because I try to learn as less as I can. Up next, we have a new dubbing stuff for you folks, and this is from the movie The Snow Creature from 1954. Um, this isn't quite the time. Hey, you guys whistling over there? <laughs> oh, that's embarrassing. Oh, well, can anyone throat sing? <gasps> oh, nice. Alright, so here's the plan, folks. We are supposed to catch a monster, and so we're going to... I don't like the sound of that. <laughs> don't worry, it'll be fine. We got these poles and everything. Well, maybe if... We're going to shoot it when we see it? Oh... I heard that. If I don't shoot something in five seconds, I'm gonna we'll get there. Do something. You think this net's actually gonna stop it? It's actually not meant to stop it. It's meant to uh, distract it while we trap it. Oh, that's great. There it is. Oh, hold! I didn't know he was gonna rush the net. Guys, come on, shoot it's it. It's a beatbox. He get it. I, I got my gun. Let's get him. I got guns. Let's get him. I need the creature to measure my neck. Oh, what size is it? I'll hit him with the butt of my gun. Yeah. Getcha. Yeah. I got probable cause. All right. I think we got them, boys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got yeah. Uh, oof. I need to adjust my tie. You okay, Finnegan? Yeah. I still don't know my next measurement. You gotta stop relying on random monsters. Well, that was easy. Yeah, you know how it goes. You gotta do your thing, gotta do your thing, whatever. That's just a cop's job. On to the next monster and such. Uh, dispatch. All right, what is it? Yes, we got a wolf man. Oh, I love dogs. I'll bring the kibble in bits. Well, the location is located, uh, you know, that one store across the street from the pharmacy? That's Just where say Rite Aid. All you have to do is say Rite Aid. Uh, what's the closest time you can get to the location? Uh, um... Oh, don't give me that attitude. You're still on the clock. You gotta do your job. All right, we'll be there in like 15 minutes. Head out. I am looking for a new pelt for my log cabin. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll stop smoking. I can wait a couple more years. But you remember our deal. If I die no before... No worries, I'll look after Helen. She just needs to know that somebody's there. Come on, let's go. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, what if you die before me? Oh, I know how I die. Oh, yeah, a tie and a fax machine. Is that why you want your neck measured? Oh, you must be a psychic, too. <laughs> <laughs> I am related to Notre Dame. Hmm? Hmm. You know what I'm going to eat next? Chicken! 
Whoa. City Council. City Council is back with a vengeance, and I only have public safety and health, but I'm going to give you the overview of what happened with your City Council and a bunch of committee meetings. Let's start with a lot of proclamations. It's Better Hearing Month. Um, what's that? Uh, for those getting older and may need assistance for better hearing, um, Missoula wants to proclaim uh, this month as Better Hearing Month. If you know somebody who is 65 and older who uh, suffers from hearing loss, uh, there's many organizations that are there to help folks along the way. Five Valley Land Trust being very crucial and um, allowing open space to thrive in the city of Missoula for natural parks since 1972. It was it was open space before it was cool. And so part of a Five Valley Land Trust is that the organization uh, creates a, a stewardship for the land and conservation uh, that goes beyond the organization, which means if the organization defuncts, you can't affect the land, hence why it's called a trust. Next, we got Bike Month. Hey, May is usually Bike Month in conjunction with the Walk and Roll Week and Bike and Pedestrian Board. On a side note, the League of American Bicyclists have des uh, designated Missoula a golden level um, bike friendly community for the last nine years. Uh, another one is it's drinking water week. Hey, if you're uh, have trouble uh, trouble hearing, but you know when you're thirsty, it is time for your drinking water week. Providing that we have to come up with some weird days. Um, <laughs> so far, the city looked to increase parkland for uh, the Best Read Park. That they're just uh, you know, it's just another extension of a park, and they're gonna kind of vacate some of the um, roundabout cul-de-sac thing that kind of got built next to uh, the Holiday Inn um, Express Hotel. And yeah, I mean, that's kind of what they talked about in terms of that. They, it was a very proclamation heavy uh, uh, city council. Up next, we got admin and finance. They are talking about expenditures and grants that are affecting the third quarter of the fiscal year. And this has everything to do with the fact that all that COVID relief money that's coming in through the city and the county is about $35 million for, the, uh, for Missoula as a whole in terms of COVID relief. And they're trying to work with that and try to adjust the fiscal year of 2021 accordingly. They make a budget. It's a lot of copy and paste from the previous year, but this last year has been really weird. So they have to figure out what the money they need for the general fund, which doesn't usually exceed $61 million a year for the city of Missoula. All right, parks and conservation. These are all about them parking lots in Fort Missoula Regional Park. This is done every seven years. Moving on, public works. The Clark Fork Area 3 levee is complete uh, flood protection system consisting of a 2,900 uh, foot embankment with a 900 foot flood wall. Oh, 900 foot flood wall. Wow. It's it's the length, not like not the height. Just, you know, um, it's located on the north side of the river from Madison Street to Orange Street. And this is because uh, the river is gets pretty high and there's a that there's always a problem with the floodplain in the city of Missoula. It, it, it's pretty commonplace if you live in a river city. Um, as this is uh, in public works, also also this is in it is to sign in into order to get funding opened up for the Mary Jane Boulevard. Uh, part of public works is Mary Jane Boulevard is going to be a nice throughway, which is going to connect Mullen to Broadway, and it's going to hopefully alleviate some of the traffic that goes down Flynn Lane, which is also a school zone. And that's part of the big thing that they're working on, and. So far, they got a $13 million build grant awarded to them in 2019. They were looking to get an additional build grants in 2020. And hopefully with this also infrastructure package that uh, the Biden administration is going to be passing, that we we'll, might be able to see some of that federal grant money going towards improving the streets and connectivity moving forward as we keep growing. All right, land use and planning. We're talking more about cash in lieu, in which needed more explanation by city council to help uh, kind of like crowdsource funding for neighborhood parks. So they wanted to kind of look more into this and figure out ways so they can actually uh, have close near parks for a lot of neighborhoods. Because otherwise you just have a neighborhood and there's really not much outdoor space for a lot of these neighborhoods. So that's really what they're trying to do. And th they mean well. Uh, there's always issues when it comes to uh, figuring out exactly who is going to pay for this, which is why 
Cash and Lou is very weird because it's kind of like feels it's very much like a crowdsourcing uh, way for cities to get parks made. All right, public safety and health. This one I actually have clips on. Um, this is uh, kind of like a. Uh, a review of the uh, winter emergency shelter for homeless folks here in the city of Missoula. They dealt with the COVID pandemic by severely reducing numbers of people who can actually stay within the Pavarella Center. I heard from another uh, homeless uh, f individual, I won't name him by name, who uh, comes into MCAT now and again. And he uh, recently told me that, uh, that they had a lottery system to those who could uh, go to the Pav and stay there. And there's also... Uh, um, they have opportunities for like showers and being able to clean yourself, even if you're not staying at the Pavarella Center. All right, the Office of Emergency Management spoke about their experience in working with folks who could not shelter in place because they didn't have many options to stay with the general population. Jesse Yeager with the Pav speaks about the Johnson Street closure as Pav transition the Pavarella Center transitioned out of the winter emergency shelter. Forward. Um, we're going to continue uh, to be following CDC guidelines around COVID and uh, the uh, need for social distance in the shelters. We have not heard anything about any of those guidances changing uh, anytime soon. Uh, we do know that it, across the sector, the expectation is, is that vaccine uptake, so people actually getting the vaccine from people who are experiencing homelessness is going to be lower than the general population. Uh, that's going to be for a lot of reasons. A uh, big one is going to be kind of some of that substance abuse, mental health challenges folks uh, experience and, and, and less trust uh, of, of those systems. So we expect that we might need to still be in these kind of socially distancing postures uh, for a little while now, at least uh, into maybe next winter. Um, we are working on our plans with our partners at the city uh, about what that looks like and have some different scenarios that we're mapping out from basically what we did this year all the way to uh, back to Salvation Army uh, and operating uh, like we did uh, uh, last year. So far, the POV and most of us are hoping that things will go back to normal and relatively soon um, going into next year. Uh, but so far, uh, the winter shelter has helped a lot of folks with the inclusion of the Johnson Street Spillover Center and the uh, temporary safe outdoor space off of Brooks and 93 uh, by, uh, I'm not naming all the organizations, but United Way of Missoula was a big proponent for this. Um, from the Missoula City County Health Department, uh, this is Adrienne Beck, and this is what she talks about their experience. Um, at this time during the pandemic, most of the hotels in Missoula County were sitting vacant because we were in a state stay at home order. However, most hotels are owned by larger corporate organizations who had a corporate policy to not allow, uh, to not knowingly rent any rooms to individuals that were suspect of or actually had COVID-19. So that really limited our, our options and our ability. And it, and it kept us in this constant state of not being able to plan and, and kind of having to react. And so amid that situation, we approached um, City Council, the mayor and the commissioners to look at if there was any um, any facilities within city or county ownership that we could retrofit for this purpose. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't find any. Um, and that's how the Sleepy Inn became to be secured by the city. Um, and uh, in April, that, that transaction occurred. And by early May, um, we were able to start taking individuals into that facility. Of course, much to many Missoulians' displeasure at the time, um, the city bought the Sleepy Inn Motel to uh, be able to create a COVID uh, shelter for homeless folks who cannot stay with the general population and to kind of separate them and put them um, there so they can let them um, quarantine in place. Um, 200 and... Um, 62 folks stayed in the shelter in place at the COVID-19 sleeping motel over the course of the pandemic uh, that held folks who weren't allowed to stay in the POV or any hotels tied to corporate businesses. Uh, FEMA public assistance was offered a staff hotel. Miss Beck also talks about costs associated with running these operations. And so over the course of the last year, we have, we've truncated those reimbursement requests into three month snapshots. Um, to date, our, our total costs to date, and this runs to the end of April, are uh, $1,138,810. Um, FEMA has reimbursed uh, Missoula County 920, uh, excuse me, nine, $929,531 
of that uh, of that total cost. We expect to, to be made whole um, when it's all done, but sometimes those reimbursements don't exactly line up. See, there is a lot of money, and Missoula did get a lot of federal aid from FEMA. That was the uh, basically the main money that a lot of people looked into because FEMA is for a lot of, of emergencies and medical and disaster relief, um, and you know money gets funded through there. And then over time, through the American Rescue Plan and the COVID relief package that passed, um, uh, the first package with the first stimulus checks really kind of helped put over the edge of a lot of these um, places. Um, most of the time, what you usually do with these organizations is they pay and they do the services and then they uh, re request reimbursement later down the line. So this could be very dangerous for a lot of organizations because if you apply for a grant and you don't get it, you don't get to recoup the cost that you use to get it there. So that's kind of how a lot of uh, these organizations work. But so far, Missoula saw nothing but good things from being able to separate homeless individuals from um their own infected communities. Um, Adrian, I, I'm, I'm talking very carefully here about how I refer to the clients and the people that go to the Pavarella Center. But Adrian Bex talks a little bit more about finding their footing. Well, I, I continue to be amazed when I look in my rear view mirror at how quickly things unfolded. Um, and so, you know, off the cuff, I would say that we would have secured a facility sooner um, because once we did that, everything kind of calmed down. Um, but it's hard to say that because the pace with which we moved was was very, very fast. And, um, and I think everybody should be applauded for that. I mean, we saw a situation, we found a solution and we executed it. Um, but I think that the recognition that, um, that we needed not only um, dedicated staff, but that we needed a dedicated social worker. Um, once all of that came into place, and that didn't come into place really until uh, probably late May, um, things really things really kind of found their stride. And we really came out of crisis management and just got into kind of program management, which is what we really were aiming to do. And, and so getting there sooner would have been better, but I'm not sure how we could have done that. Primarily uh, high-risk folks, those who fail, uh, fall into substance abuse and mental illness categories, uh, they call them tier three. The social workers were able to jump in and help those in need of permanent housing. Um, there's always going to be issues because they have to, uh, um, um, I'm going off script, bear with me, but they have to uh, use honey and not vinegar you know, to attract uh, folks to try to get them help that they need. Um, so far, they were able to recoup a lot of the cost of uh, $900,000 out of the $1.1 million spent through this um, sleepy in hotel um, shelter in place kind of deal. So far, COVID numbers are low and the health board is confident in their ability to stay on top of contact tracing. And so far, the sleepy in non-congregate shelter is being used as to shelter in place for those who have never had that option before. Jesse Yeager, once again, is very happy that Missoula acquired the Sleepy Inn. And although that there was a high death toll, well, with anyone dying, it's very tragic. Um, he is very happy that we were able to keep the numbers as low as we could. The death count uh, for COVID amongst the homeless population in Missoula would have been significantly higher if that didn't place did not exist. Uh, we worked very closely with Aliche and the um, and that team to get people out of the POV shelter and into non congregate setting. And the reason we didn't have the kind of COVID spread within our facility uh, uh, is 100 percent by side. I'm convinced we saved, you know, hundreds of lives uh, um, because of that. There are some communities that saw 70 to 80 percent COVID positive rates within their shelters. And we never even got close to anything like that in Missoula. So uh, we absolutely save people's lives because of the Sleepy Inn and, and that, that project. Well, that does it for your public safety and health. If you want those meetings and more, you can log on to ci.missoula.mt.us. Those resources are available for all of you there. Um, what else do I need to talk about today? I... I don't have too much to talk about. I do want to keep uh, th this wrapped up because I only have so much time because now I'm just getting back to work at the new library. So this week kind of marks the first official week of the library. And so far we've been open from 9 to 12. And um, <coughs> the patrons have been given um, wristbands and only be allowed to stay within the library for about an hour, do their thing, check out, do some prints, 
I've noticed a lot of uh, unique individuals for sure. Um, but what I've seen in most of my services have been uh, renting out hotspots uh, for uh, people of the library. MCAT is not checking out equipment to uh, people who have a library card. Um, you have to do additional training, which is happening this Saturday at 10 a.m. at the Missoula Public Library uh, at the MCAT location on the first floor. So if you want to learn more about that, you can log on to MCAT.org. You can call us at 542-6228, otherwise known as 542-MCAT. So what that does it for my morning show. I'm going to have to cut it as fast as possible. Thank you for joining me and for Wake Up Missoula. I'm Scott Ramsey.